My name's Kevin Bailey and I'm a visual effects artist. I got my start when I was 18 years old in the industry on Star Wars The Phantom Menace and have since worked on movies like Harry Potter and the Goblet of the Fire, Transformers Age of Extinction, and a whole bunch of movies with Robert Zemeckis. We're here today to talk about the five Visual Effects Academy Award nominees and what makes them so groundbreaking. What's really exciting to me as a visual effects artist about this year's field of nominees is how diverse they are. Some years you have three or four really similar films and one kind of stands above the rest and it's an easy guess. This year it's everything from digital characters to de-aging to uh, invisible effects, virtual production. Every film stands for something different. First, let's look at Avengers Endgame. Avengers Endgame, which is a whole tie-up to the Marvel comic universe, really built upon successes of previous Marvel films with their digital characters. Thanos was an amazing performing digital character in Infinity War that made use of machine learning and all kinds of cool tech to bring him to life in that film. And they just elevated that technology to a whole new level. And not only was there Thanos, in this film we also had Smart Hulk, right? So we had multiple digital characters that were performing emoting that the audience could really connect with. In previous Marvel movies, the Hulk has always been this sort of raging, stupid embodiment of anger. And he didn't really have to connect with the audience on any other level than that. With Smart Hulk in Avengers Endgame, he actually has got his wits about him. Maybe smash a few things along the way. I think it's gratuitous, but whatever. And he's sitting there performing alongside his live action actors and needs to be up to the very same level as them with every nuance of performance that he gives. And now they can be best of both worlds. There was some pretty amazing technology that went into bringing Thanos and Smart Hulk to life in Avengers Endgame. In the past, there's been, you know, techniques used where there's thousands of dots on an actor's face, and every single one of them is trying to drive like a little piece of a digital character's performance. But there's always stuff that happens in between the dots that we miss, right? And we end up with this kind of uncanny valley effect uh, with digital characters. Well, by using machine learning, they spent a lot of time actually teaching the computer how these faces should move. And then when the actor goes to perform with these head-mounted cameras on, they're actually not capturing that much data. They're just sort of getting the gist of what the actor's doing. When I had the gauntlet, the stones, I, I really tried to bring her back. And they feed that to the machine learning algorithm. And it analyzes what the face is doing and it effectively fills in the blanks and translates that to Smart Hulk's performance. So they actually use a lot of different sets of input data, what we call it training data, to learn how an actor's face should move. So there's a very, very high resolution scan of the actor's face that's hundreds of cameras, uh, multiple lights uh, that tell us not only how their face is shaped, but how their skin reacts to different kind of light hitting it. And then we also put them through what we call facial range of motions, right? Which is them going through every expression uh, you can possibly imagine. It's actually very tiring going through this, but what it allows us to do is to see down to a poor level of detail what their skin does in three dimensions as they go from a smile to a frown, for example. Terabytes of data go into the input to train the machine learning algorithms, and that allows us to actually not capture a lot of data on set, then we can correlate that small amount of data with this intense data set that we have for training to create an incredibly rich performance of a fully digital character. In addition to these stunning digital characters in Avengers Endgame, there are entire worlds that are designed from scratch, just sort of out of people's imagination, built down to every blade of grass. And doing that in a level that is consistent across an entire film. I mean, this film had 2,500 individual shots that had visual effects in them. To make that consistent across the whole film uh, is a huge, huge task on this scale, and they really nailed it. People keep telling me they know me. No one does. But I do. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker 
was a film that really played heavily on nostalgia uh, from a visual effects perspective and a storytelling perspective. Not only did the visual effects team have to kind of build on this Star Wars universe that we've become so used to seeing and to have it feel really authentic and physical and gritty and grounded, but they had to bring multitudes of digital and actually live action puppets to life. Star Wars has always been groundbreaking from a technology perspective, but it's also always been grounded in reality, right? The, the world just feels tactile. And in this film, they went to huge lengths to pay respect to how the original films were made. They used tons of practical models and actual physical set builds in addition to a lot of digital techniques that are cutting edge even for today. That real blend of physical with state of the art is part of the Star Wars DNA. One of the biggest challenges we always have in deciding how we're gonna film a movie is deciding what's gonna be real versus what's gonna be digital. In the scene that takes place on the sunken Death Star, Roger Guyette, the visual effects supervisor and his team had to decide what water should be real versus what should be digital. And they ended up doing the vast majority of the water digitally. They actually created an entirely new ocean pipeline in order to be able to execute those shots. But not all of the water was digital. One of the really important things for us as a visual effects team is to make sure that the actors always have context to help with their performances. And especially when it's something that they need to touch, having something there for real, like having these waves that are crashing over them be there for real, is critical to achieving a believable illusion. A really touching part of Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker was seeing Carrie Fisher on screen again uh, playing Princess Leia posthumously. Instead of using the digital facial techniques that are heavily used by some of the other contenders this year, they opted to use Carrie Fisher's real face, filmed from footage from past films, and augment it with digital hair and a digital body around her so that she fit into her environment. I think that that really helped Carrie's soul come out on screen, and it was really appropriate for that moment, right? So. Thanos absolutely deserves to be a digital character. Uh, Carrie in this film, the only way to do her was to actually use her. Since my days as an 18 year old on Star Wars Episode I, digital effects have come so, so far. Back then, we really had to be restrictive about how we used the effects. So digital characters were incredibly difficult um, to achieve. We had to make sure that the camera wasn't moving too much in any one shot, otherwise it would make the shots take a long time and be way too expensive. Now, we're sort of freed up to be able to do almost anything that we can imagine. And so what filmmakers are challenged with these days is not to ask whether something can be done, which is what we faced back in the days of Star Wars Episode One, but should it be done? And how does it service the story? And I think Star Wars has evolved as a franchise to be a great example of a film that uses the right tool for the right job. In your own time, gentlemen. Must be something big if the channel's here. They're walking into a trap. Your orders are to deliver a message calling off tomorrow morning's attack. If you don't get there in time, we will lose 1,600 men. 1917 is a movie that you might not look at and say, oh, that's a visual effects movie. Uh, you would be sorely mistaken. It is full of visual effects beginning to end. The whole movie plays as one continuous shot where there's no cuts that you can actually see in the film. And that required an immense amount of work from the visual effects team. The film was actually shot in several different locations, some of them outdoors, some of them inside on sound stages, over the course of several months. And so how do you make that all look like one seamless piece of storytelling? Between each piece of footage shot on different days in different places, digital effects artists had to seamlessly blend from one to the next in a way that the audience can actually perceive it. One of the more dramatic examples of one of these digital blends is a scene where our hero character is running out of a village that's on fire away from gunmen, jumps off a bridge and into a river, uh, and then floats down the river. As the actor came around and jumped off the bridge, he was transitioned to a fully digital actor 
until he lands in the water, and then he became that same actor, but on a different day, in a different place. So just that one example is thousands of man hours of visual effects time to bring that to life. In addition to all of the digital blends, what a lot of people don't realize is how much digital work is done to actually plus out this World War I period world, where tanks that are stuck in giant craters, they're actually fully digital, they were never built for real. Um, big fields that have uh, tons of spent ammunition strewn all over, very little of that was actually real. And it all felt incredibly grounded, it felt like it was really there. And to me, those kinds of effects, what we call invisible visual effects, that are there to support the story rather than be the story, are some of my favorite kinds of effects. It was like the army. You followed orders, you did the right thing, you got rewarded. The Irishman featured one specific technique that is what got it nominated for an Oscar. That is the de-aging of some of the most well-known and well-loved actors of our time. And to do that for the entire film without falling into the uncanny valley is a massive challenge. What the visual effects supervisor, Pablo Hellman, and his team did on that film was to actually really use the actor's facial expressions on a movie set as ground truth and they made a digital mask, effectively, that went over that actor's face. To make these digital masks move perfectly, they filmed every actor with not one camera, but three. We had the main camera that was the normal camera that you would use to shoot a movie, and then we had two what we call witness cameras on either side. And between those three cameras and a special piece of software that Industrial Light and Magic wrote called Flux, they were able to actually analyze every movement of an actor's face. Flux was actually able to figure out what each actor was doing exactly, create the younger version of them, and then that would be superimposed on the older version of the actor, and that became the final result. It was really important to Martin Scorsese to be able to shoot this like a normal movie, without motion capture, right? He didn't want a bunch of technology getting in the way of the process. So the two cameras, the witness cameras that are on either side of the main camera, they actually shoot infrared footage because uh, that allows the visual effects team to light the scene in a way that allows those cameras to actually see the actor. Like, we can't see infrared light, so we can just pump in visual infrared light into the set and see really clearly what the actors are doing, even though Scorsese wants to light it as like a really dark, moody scene. So what the Irishman visual effects team did was actually brilliant, is that they figured out how to get out of the way of the filmmaking process of this you know, genius in Scorsese to get all the data that they needed. A really important part of bringing these younger versions of these actors to life was actually using thousands of images and video clips from each actor in their younger days so that they could not only build a face that looked like kind of what we remember them to have looked like in the past, but also to help train algorithms within the Flux software to make the faces move authentically. Where are we gonna go, but up? When watching The Irishman for all three and a half hours of the movie, I actually felt like they were really successful in bringing these younger versions of the actors to life. There was some criticism about, oh, you know, the, the posture of the actors was a little more like an old man than it was the younger version of yourself. And to be honest, I think the sign of success with any effect is whether it helps to engage you in the movie or if it bumps you out of the movie. And for the duration of The Irishman, I was just fully engaged in those characters. So the little technical flaws of, in this instance, posture, um, they just didn't stand out to me. I've heard a lot of actors talk about The Irishman as giving them a new lease on life, right? Um, the fact that these actors could perform as younger versions of themselves and do so so convincingly I think has pretty big ramifications for storytellers moving forward. Uh, we can now look at casting actors based on their personality and their fit for a role and less for their age. Some people talk about the ethical concerns of being able to create a digital version of any actor out there and it's like, oh, are we gonna replace actors one day? And I think The Irishman is proof positive that that's just 
not going to happen. It's nonsensical. There is no amount of digital wizardry, I, I promise you this, that is going to bring a performance to the level that a De Niro is going to bring to the, the screen, right? And that foundation, that soul of the actor, that's what we're responding to from an emotional perspective. And as the Irishman proved to us, the digital wizardry, more than replacing an actor's performance, it's complementing it. It's actually helping to highlight it and build upon it. And that, as a storyteller, is an incredibly exciting prospect to leverage more and more into the future. In The Lion King, Rob Legato, the visual effects supervisor, and his team created an entirely digital world for the story to take place in. In fact, there's only one shot in the movie, the opening shot, that was filmed in Africa. Everything else is completely virtual, but it feels like real life. It feels like you're watching a National Geographic documentary. Now, the danger of having a completely virtual world that you can do anything you want in is that it could end up looking like a video game. No matter how realistic the grass looks, if the camera's not moving correctly and if the lighting isn't cinematic, it's just not gonna work. So what Rob Legato and his visual effects team did on the film is they designed virtual production tools that allowed real camera teams with real camera cranes and dollies and steady cams that were puppeteering these digital cameras in the virtual world. And so what you end up with is a feel of the movie that is every bit as naturalistic as if it had been shot in the African plains. The thing that's always a dead giveaway with digital effects is when things are too perfect. Right? The natural world, it has a certain amount of chaos that is completely unavoidable. And by using virtual production and real camera equipment to design these digital camera moves, that imperfection that we're so used to seeing in cinema is translated onto these digital African planes so that it just looks like something that we're used to seeing. Predicting who's going to take home the Oscar this year is and I'm not copping out here, it's just totally impossible. All of the films that are nominated are so different, and I really think that the winner is gonna be probably the story that ended up connecting with audiences the most.